All right. Uh, we are talking today with John Cameron, who has been doing weather in Texoma since 1999. Is that correct? Yeah, off and on. Not not for 20 plus years, but off and on. I did take a couple of breaks, you might say, um, 2008, 2009, but uh, slipped back into weather. Um, 2011 had been doing it uh, ever since. Now, that whenever you were doing weather around that time, was that around the time of the drought? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, the drought was at its worst in 2011. I think we, James, I think we landed less than a foot of rain that year. And Wichita Falls averages just under 30 inches, about 29 inches. Um, it just so happens, and uh, you know, I, I won't take credit, but uh, it just so happens that about the time I slipped back into the Weather Center late in 2011, it began to rain again, um, <laughs> October, uh, September, October, um, and things just got better uh, since then. Yeah. You know, what's funny is whenever the rain finally came, it had been so long without rain that me and the kids went out to Lake Wichita and I'd realized they'd never seen water in there. We had been, yeah. we'd been up and down that path, but every time they had seen it, just been some drained piece of land yes. to them. They didn't, they didn't yes. know it was a lake. You could literally <laughs> walk across it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and, uh, you know, people would call the TV station and say, John, how long is it going to take to get out of this drought to make things right again? And I, my common response was, well, it will take just as long to get out as it did to get into a very serious situation. And then <laughs> spring of 2015 comes around. Yeah. And James, we quite literally undo the drought over the span of five weeks. Um, wow. I don't know if you remember May of 2015, anyone who was involved with weather or the forecasting of weather um, does, because I think over through the month, that entire month of 2015, May, that is, we got about 25 inches of rain. And if you, if you looked at the, the uh, level the level gauge uh, chart, if you will, for Lake Arrowhead, it literally went up like a spike and went back to almost a, its normal reservoir level uh, just over a matter of days. It was absolutely stunning. Have we seen anything drought-like since, or has it just been steady uh, <laughs> rain since, or has it been at least enough throughout the year to keep us float? You know, as someone who's... <laughs> As someone who's been keeping an eye on the weather for 20 years, I am convinced that North Texas weather basically is drought uh, interrupted by occasional flash flooding. You know, it's, it's never normal. You know, you never have a truly normal year. It's always very dry spells. And you, you need only ask a farmer or a rancher. They are the weather experts here. Yeah. Um, and it's really just dry spells. And then, you know, a week, or a few days will come along and it will rain and rain like biblically <laughs> and then things are suddenly green again. So is that the normal, cause I born and raised, I was born and raised in Wichita Falls and I am not a fan of the weather. I've never, I, <laughs> we get, and I make my kids and everyone else. And I tell the town, these are the two to three weeks that we get before summer and before winter that are decent at best go yes. outside and enjoy them because you're not going to be able to enjoy any other weather. It's Absolutely. extremely hot during the summer. Um, yeah. Is there, is that just how weather is around here? Explain a little bit to us. Cause you know, the region, that's the reason mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you, you know, Texoma uh, weather. And how is it that we get this type of weather? Yeah, it's, I think that Texoma is probably one of the hottest places um, I got to say this right, east of the Rockies. I mean, obviously, we're not going to compete with Arizona and Southern California and Nevada, uh, those historically hot places. But it's just a combination of uh, elevation and latitude. And you'll notice that right when we chop out wheat in, uh, when do we chop out wheat? In June? It seems like that's really when it starts um, getting hot. You know, um, the, our, the ground uh, has a reflective quality to it. It reflects that sunlight. And I think 
when we when we uh, chop out wheat and the surface kind of loses that reflectivity. Now, granted, I have to consider that length of days and the amount of available sunlight it certainly contributes. And you know, we have the most daylight, we have the most sunlight available to us in June and July. But man, uh, yeah, gosh, by the time we get to this time of the year, me, I'm sure everyone else is just absolutely worn out with this heat. Uh, someone like me who's trying to stay on a bicycle when I can, you know, if I don't, if I don't start my bike ride at 7, 7.30 in the morning, I'm going to be absolutely miserable by the yeah. time 9 o'clock rolls around trying to get in some exercise. So, so uh, yeah, uh, the, these, uh, I think, I want to say that the record high for the state of Texas was set in Seymour. There are a lot of Texas cities that will claim that they were the hottest spot, but I think it was uh, during the mid-1930s, Seymour made it to 120 degrees. And uh, goodness gracious, I, we don't want any part of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you are um, from uh, Lawton. Is that what you're originally from? Yeah, born in Topeka, Kansas, uh, but have little memory of Kansas. My father was transferred to the Goodyear plant in Lawton in 1979 when I was six and a half years old. So, yeah, grew up in Lawton and didn't leave Lawton until I joined the Navy in the early 90s. And you were gone overseas or where, where did that lead you to? I was one of those weird cats who, uh, despite being a junior enlisted person, I never it's almost embarrassing to say being in the Navy, but I never went to sea. I got the final, what they call the final shore billet uh, in my training school. Uh, so I uh, did a short little spell in Mississippi, then uh, got orders to Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, could have been worse. So I went from, <laughs> you know, uh, compare and contrast a lot in Oklahoma with Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was, uh, it was uh, in Jacksonville that I got out of the Navy in, in 1995 and came back uh, to cohabitate with my then girlfriend who was going to graduate school at OU. What sparked your interest in weather? Was it whenever you were in the military or? Always had a fascination with it. Um, my family, before I was born, lived in T Topeka, Kansas. There was a really bad tornado in Topeka, Kansas uh, in 1966, June of 66. And um, that made a huge impact on my mother and my brother. Um, did, no, no harm was done, but it really just scared them. Um, so I think my mother kind of modeled that fear of weather to me was always kind of, she was always kind of anxious anytime it would get stormy. And also, this is kind of interesting. Um, my, my initial interest in uh, being a weather guy was not, was not just the weather. I was always fascinated with maps. When my, you know, when my friends were reading books and getting smart, I I was flipping through road atlases. I loved geography. I love to look at maps of the United States and maps of Texas and Oklahoma. So when I would see the weather, um, I, grew in, I grew up in a household where, you know, parents sat down and watched the news every, you know, six, whatever, six in the evening. And I saw, not only did I see weather, but I saw these big, beautiful maps. And it appeared like these guys were standing in front of these amazing maps and then watching the radar sweep around. I just, it was just an instant connection for me. And I'll be honest with you, James, um, because of some challenges I have as a person who just can't wrap my brain around some mathematics concepts, um, I never imagined that I would ever do weather on television simply because, you know, you had to tick certain boxes. You had to have a certain aptitude for mathematics and physics and stuff like that. Um, so while weather was not my job in the Navy, I did kind of uh, hang around what they call aerographers, which are naval forecasters. And I learned how they did their job. And I eventually took the test to become an aerographer, passed the test, and uh, was even eligible for a promotion within the field that I wasn't even 
actually working in. Um, long story short, by the time I get to Wichita Falls and eventually get involved in Channel 6, the, the chief meteorologist, the chief meteorologist at the time um, recognizes that uh, perhaps there is something there. There's something I can build on as far as my knowledge of weather and my ability to communicate it. And if it honestly, James, if it hadn't been for that person, Tom Charles, chances are I may have never done uh, television weather because he gave me an opportunity few people would have because you know if you didn't have the college education or if you weren't a degree meteorologist that was a deal breaker so yeah. honestly if it hadn't been for Tom Charles who, who just happened to be the chief of Channel 6 at the time after spending what three decades at Channel 7 I was given an opportunity most people wouldn't have been given well I, I completely understand the maths and, and kind of looking at the geography and kind of understanding how weather changes and develops depending on where you are. And I'll be completely honest with you, my fascination for that is because of you. Now, I remember one time on Facebook, you had posted something that I, I bring up in conversations all the time, which was the map of Oklahoma and Texas. And what you were doing was you were studying histories of tornadoes, their paths, and where they've been. And you wanted to focus on towns like Moore, Oklahoma, right. who yeah. I remember at a, a certain point of time, they were in the news like every year. What was yeah, they, it about that area that creates that? And it's always there. Like it's always in Moore, Oklahoma, because it looked like, you know, just like a scratch cat uh, clawed <laughs> at it because of the, yeah. the, the, where it was. Yes, what, what I was showing were these traces of tornadoes, especially significant tornadoes, and just, have, you're right, it's kind of a scratch on the, on the map. And granted, Texas, Oklahoma are hot spots for tornadoes. The, the ingredients are often here for um, the recipe for tornadoes, um, not only in the spring, but often in the fall. But... I, I don't recall the specific posts, but if you looked at one of these maps that showed these traces of significant tornadoes, you would think, you would easily come to the conclusion that more and to a greater extent, the Oklahoma City Metro is an absolute hotspot. However, comma, um, it's, it's really just, I don't wanna say luck. It's sometimes it's just coincidence. It's just pure coincidence. I, honestly, James, if we were here, in um, 1985, Wichita Falls probably would have had the same reputation because by the time we get to April 10, 79, that's the third significant tornado to impact the city over the span of 21 years. And it's been, what, 40 plus since 1979, and we haven't had a super high impact tornado so it's really just, you know, it's really just kind of a run of bad luck. Well, you'd mentioned uh, the 79 tornado. Now, I don't know if you remember that or if it had effect on you all the way in uh, Lawton, but growing up in Wichita Falls, the funny thing is I can't really recall tornadoes because it was 79. I don't recall that. But yeah. people my age remember the fear from their parents. Yes. And that equaled fear for me. So I had a fear of the weather. As a matter of fact, my first um, solo album was Lullaby for the Rapture. That was all about the weather. That was, it was created because we were going through a drought. And I'd heard mm -hmm. some talks around town about the end of the world, even though other parts <laughs> of the world yeah. were getting rain. Um, yeah. Did that fear, was that ever in Lawton? Did you ever experience that uh, growing up? Or, You know, um especially in the, past, in the last 10 years of my doing weather on television, I, it was pretty common for parents, especially young parents of children under age 10 to reach out to me and offer advice to uh, kids who were just flat out scared of the weather. Um, one of the worst case scenarios is um, there was a young boy uh, who I believe he lived in Wichita Falls or maybe maybe Archer City, and he would refuse to go to the state of Oklahoma because he was convinced through either social media or television that 
Oklahoma is where all the really bad tornadoes happen. Um, and I was, I was, I was heartbroken. What, but what I've come to find is that when there are children in the household who are upset by the weather, that fear, that anxiety is being modeled by parents. No fault to them. Um, but what I often do is I will encourage, and this, this is tough, but I encourage if there is stormy weather, not life-threatening weather, but stormy weather where it sounds bad outside, I would often encourage parents to take the kids outside. And, and realize that maybe it's not as bad as it sounds because wind tends to sound often worse than it is. Uh, obviously, a tornado is an exception, but you know, it takes just a you know, 30, 40 mile per hour wind to make it sound like all hell's breaking loose yeah. outside. And I often encourage folks to just go out and see it and experience the weather because sometimes if, if we're getting everything we know about the weather from television, social media, or you know any type of media it can be sensationalized and perhaps uh, overblown to some degree so i say man just go out go out and look at it yeah and realize you're, that you're, you know you're watching the highlights of the storm they're not yeah. just going to show you the boring you know there was a frog that sat on a curb for about two hours they're not going to show you the boring parts they're going to show you all the crazy lawn chairs right. flying trampolines flipping yeah. um and, a moment you know, I, the storm. One thing I always stood firm on as a, as a weather communicator is I would never, I would never let anyone tell me that I had to bring some kind of added sensation to um, what our experience as North Texans was going to be. You know, <laughs> we as Texans and Oklahomans have been surviving thunderstorms for at least a hundred years, uh, hundreds of years. And now granted, we have amazing technology available to us that keeps us ahead of the storm and out of harm's way. But, you know, sometimes we have this natural, we hear thunder or we see dark skies or we hear the wind picking up. There's a natural inclination to A, wonder, you know, what the, what the problem is and B, take shelter. Uh, we, fear is a great motivation. But we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be needlessly fearful of the weather just based on what we're getting from social media, television, whatever the case may be. A problem we have had as, as professional broadcast meteorologists, and this has been a very serious problem, um, uh, Facebook tends to be the biggest problem, but we have what, what, what they have deemed social meteorologists. These are people who are probably in their mom's basement that have nothing better to do than to, well, they, they, they position and present themselves as experts and they'll try to sensationalize. They may not know anything really about the weather except where to find kind of scary imagery or scary forecast data or something like that and post it claiming to be an expert and making people super fearful I had people, I had people, you know, viewers of Channel 6 who would send me stuff on Facebook saying, oh, John, this guy over here is saying that we're going to have really bad tornadoes this afternoon. I don't, I don't understand why you're not saying, you're not saying anything about it. And I was like, because there's not going to be anything. <laughs> so it was a constant, <laughs> it was a constant battle between those of us who actually had the, the know-how and the uh, the expertise versus some knucklehead in mom's basement that didn't have anything better to do but to try to freak people out. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that you not you not only do the weather, uh, you are also a very talented drummer who uh, pl has played with some bands around town. When did, yeah. when did you first get going in drums? Uh, okay, so I, I got my first drum kit when I was 14th. It was supposed to be for my 14th birthday, but uh, me and my parents didn't realize how long it took to get a, a kit once it was ordered. So uh, while I turned 14 in July of some year, um, <laughs> I didn't get I didn't get my uh, didn't get my kit my Ludwig kit until late uh, late that summer. And uh, so it was from that point forward that everyone in my family uh, began going deaf and. Uh, I, uh, man, it's just, it's just, okay. 
let me put it this way. As someone who has tried to mess around playing guitar, and I've got, I mean, I've got a guitar right next to me. I've got a banjo over there. Um, there is no doubt, James, that I, I was born with some kind of natural inclination uh, for drumming uh, because even when I watch myself drums, when I post these stupid little Facebook things, I'm like, I, I'd listen to that guy play. Yeah. Um, but man, drummer, when I, I love it. I love watching well, you play. When I try to mess around with guitar, no matter whether I'm trying to look at a book or just trying to kind of feel it out for myself, I'm like, this is real. <laughs> so I think, easy, I, I think I was, I think I was born with some kind of natural gift for, uh, for rhythm and just kind of hearing things and being able to, because I, I can't read music. I, I, yes, I took some lessons when I was very, very young. Um, but basically I'm, I'm a product of just kind of trial and error. I would listen, I would just listen to great music and see if perhaps I could duplicate what I'm hearing the drums and, Sometimes, sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. Now, we were in the long pause in 2020. Did you find drumming um, as something therapeutic? Did it help you out uh, this year or, or did the guitar playing help you out? Well, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I, because I haven't been able to play too much guitar because, because of pandemic and because of people working from home, because of kids not going to school, I've got a full small house and I don't, I don't want to drive them crazy with me plucking away at a uh, guitar. So um, again, because of small house, I also can't really play drums without driving everyone absolutely insane. So I just pack the car up and that's why I'm making these videos. I would lo throw the uh, drums in the car, find kind of a cool background, uh, set up a camera and just go at it. And it was absolutely, Absolutely uh, cathartic and redeeming, and uh, it, it was it was the distraction I needed. And hopefully, you know, if it distracted someone else from the torments of Facebook, then uh, then uh, I'm I'm all for that. Yeah, it's absolutely. And, and I, I still kind of shy away from compliments. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just doing what I do. But uh, oh, it's great. It, it is fun. It is uh, great stuff. I love uh, watching. One time, I was in um, I'm in the shed right now. I'm in the shed quarters. And uh, I saw it, and I had my guitar. I just happened to be jamming um, my guitar right before I turned it on. So I was like, "Man, I want to jam!" So I just James, sat there that was while you were playing. <laughs> that was the that was one of the highlights of my year. I was like, "This guy," <laughs> because I'm like, you know, I I would absolutely love to play shows with you. You know, if you were ever auditioning drummers, keep me in mind. But um yeah that was so cool i was like we're jamming you know myself um jose okay what was that when it was i think it was just and, you by yourself i saw the footage later of you yeah, romeo and brandon, jose and uh, brandon right, yeah. jamming but it was just you by yourself and i think you were okay. at the park and you were just jamming out and i yeah. had happened but i was at my shed watching you yes. and i thought man this is a, so i turned up the bluetooth grabbed my speakers cranked them all the way up so i could hear the drums even better uh, cranked on my mess of boogie and just started. Yes. So you, oh man, you gotta get you a shed, so man. Great. Get you a shed because my yeah. family says, Get out of the house. Yes, and I come in here and I make as much noise as possible. Exactly. That's how my day begins. You need it. And uh, I will say, you know, because uh, since I'm no longer on the crazy weatherman schedule, there will be more opportunities for me to get involved uh, in music and maybe theater. I thought about maybe auditioning for a theater role whenever that comes around again and yeah uh, yeah so there would be i man i think wichita falls needs a funk band i mean an old dirty 70s funk I, I don't know if we have any keyboard players in the area I, but i uh, know i know everyone that's supposed to be in that band for you so don't sweat it okay show, i'll let I'll you know be. everyone we're supposed to you're supposed to be talking to you know that's a, a, a genre of band that i've heard brought up many many years and mm -hmm. um i even if you had like 17 that started up tomorrow tomorrow still wouldn't yeah. be enough for me i love sure. listening to funk funk music and again i i let you know before we started recording uh i have been watching you since 99 uh you're always one of my favorite people to see on tv uh it's it's a it's uh sad that you're not lo no longer going to be doing weather yeah but i, I did want to ask you because i noticed this from another uh, meteorologists from town that quit or let or, or stopped working, uh, Mr. Skip McBride, 
Mm. And I, one thing I noticed from Skip was he had a hard time letting it go. It's got to still be there. It's can't, it can't really go anywhere, right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, you know, with the uh, with the anticipation of the arrival of uh, Hurricane Laura, which looks like it's going to be a very serious situation for the Texas coast. I'm looking at model data. I'm, you know, I'm seeing how uh, not only will it impact the Texas coast, but uh, will there be any impact here in Texoma? So yeah, man, I'm. I, I think it's just in me to uh, always be looking ahead, whether it be you know planning for that next bike ride or uh, seeing what the weekend's going to be. Um, so yeah, it's going to be difficult to, it's going to be difficult to, uh, at least separate now, uh, now, okay. Uh, one thing I really look forward to James is, um, when, when the weather seems to be at its very worst, when the weather is at its worst, I tend to be in a windowless studio. Uh, so it's going to be nice to actually go out, look at a thunderstorm, photograph it, experience it, just be there in the moment and not really have to worry about sending out the alarm or rushing to work or stressing myself out wondering, what is this storm going to do to people and um, am I going to be able to communicate that threat? That's very stressful. It's very demanding and it's, you know, it's a 24-7 deal. So it will be nice to be able to kind of fall back in love with the weather. Um, if I see a bad storm on my phone app, my radar app, I could get in my car and actually go look at it. You know, <laughs> instead of yeah. instead of rushing to the rushing to the uh, studio and um, just making sure that I uh, don't jumble my words when I'm trying to talk about uh, threatening weather. Not. Not that I'm going to be negligent and say, oh, hey, there's a tornado. I don't need to tell anyone. Um, <laughs> but it, it, John, you know, what's the scoop? Looks like a tornado. Is it? This, uh, yeah, this job, it had an impact on me. And I've lost a lot of sleep over the years. But it also had an impact on my family. When In that eight-year span, when I was doing morning weather for Channel 6 from 2011 to just you know this past spring, James, my alarm went off at 1.10, and I was at the station at 2 o'clock, and my wife is an educator. She has a normal uh, work schedule, but she couldn't sleep through me, you know, taking a shower at 1.30 in the morning. Yeah. So it, it, did have a, it did have a resonating impact uh, on my family. You know, my, uh, suddenly my children are uh, 22 and 18, and I'm like, just a little bit of that childhood because I was, you know, at work watching the weather. Now, I'm, believe me, I'm not going to sit here and say that this, uh, it, was, it was a bad job and uh, hated any, every moment. That's far from the case. Uh, in fact, it's, it's going to be, I'm still kind of licking my, my wounds. I, it's going to be difficult to, again, um, get over it. Um, but uh, it, it will be nice to kind of fall back in love with what used to be a source of stress and that was just texas and oklahoma weather because i mm -hmm. I, I have to do weather for radio um yes. i don't i don't do anywhere near as much work as you so i don't want to <laughs> claim it but whenever there's bad weather there was a time where you have to just kind of look at the kids and say all right y'all stay yeah. here and be safe right i'm going to go out in this <laughs> i think again i i don't do anywhere near as much work as you as a matter of fact i'm the dude that's watching you going john says it's getting <laughs> crazy out there so i'm 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 just relaying stuff i'm yes. not really doing anything so i want to say thank you first and foremost from from me and from the the community for for oh. serving our community uh the way you do whenever you report weather the way you do uh you don't hype it up you just give weather the way it is uh, it's greatly appreciated by people like me. Um, key word was always calm. John, you're always so calm. Um, not, not indifferent, but calm. And, uh, and I think that just comes with understanding, um, not, not, knee, not being knee jerk and, and understanding that if, if I show any, you know, anxiety or fear, that's not a good message. Yeah, you know, that's not a good message to people relying on us to uh, just tell them what what what's happening, where there where there may be a threat, and what to do. Um, yeah. So, I, I, 
I feel that uh, if, if there's one thing I've done, it's, it's that. Yeah, staying calm uh, because if you were constantly freaking out over the weather, it'd be hard to take you seriously after a while. I mean, let me just say this. If I was to look on TV and see you with your like sleeves all rolled up with sweat <laughs> pouring down your face, I'd be like, something <laughs> is wrong. Yes. All I can say is it's about to go down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I've been talking with John Cameron, who uh, has, again, served this community with weather uh, for, the, for almost over 20 years now, man. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Wish you nothing but the best, buddy. It's always a pleasure, James.